Guten Morgen, vielen Dank für diese ganz nette Einleitung. Ich werde auf Englisch vortragen. Meine Texte, meine Quellen kommen aus Großbritannien, wie ich. Und ähm, deshalb dachte ich, das wäre besser auf Englisch. Also ich versuche das so deutlich wie möglich zu machen, ja, äh, für nicht ähm, Muttersprache. Okay. Comparing emotional communities, Moravians, Methodists and Halopietists. And you see the Halopietists here are in parentheses because I didn't get to that bit yet. My plan was to spend the spring here in Halle to work on personal narratives, but my position changed at my university, and so now I will be pushing paper, um, having gone, as we say in America, to the dark side of administration. <laughs> so, recent scholarship in the fields of the history of, motion, of emotions, gender, and pietism has pointed to the intentional creation of emotional communities in the practice of piety. For example, Engelbrecht and Ghent both identify the centrality of the cultivation, relation, and regulation of emotions in pietistic communities. In her study of the heart religion within the early Methodist movement in Britain, Phyllis Mack draws on published and manuscript materials within the Methodist archives to provide a gripping analysis of men's and women's emotions. And similarly, Bruce Hindmarsh, in his account of the evangelical conversion narrative, draws on the sermons and letters of application to Charles and John Wesley in his analysis of the emotions of conversion, in addition to a small selection of Moravian memoirs as well. But such comparative <coughs> studies are few. The field of comparative sentiment analysis opens up an intriguing window into the expressed feelings of past authors. It can also reveal the differing social, cultural, and community expectations of emotional expression, both physical and verbal, and also probably musical too, but I'll leave that to Miriam to talk about. <clears throat> the norming of emotions may particularly apply to minoritized authors from marginalized populations, which I think about a lot, you know, when I was listening to your talk yesterday, where the personal expression is heightened by a consciousness, consciousness of power imbalance expressed through language and language choice. Written memoirs can exemplify not only the deployment of sentiment dictionaries or lexica, but also reveal code switching, where authors speak or write differently depending on context, social situation, and the community with which they are interacting. <clears throat> In this paper, I will lay out, the, lay out the framework for comparing emotional vocabularies using two corpora of first-person narratives from the Moravian Church and the Methodist Church from the mid-18th century. The Moravian texts are from the Fetter Lane Congregation in London, and the majority of the manuscripts can be found in Moravian Church House. These texts have been transcribed, encoded, and published on the Moravian Lives website. The Methodist corpus is compiled from a project housed at the Rylands Library in Manchester, which contains letters of petition to Charles Wesley, transcribed by volunteers and available online. Um, I love that um, picture, the Rapture of Reason. So if you Google Rapture of Reason, reason you'll, you'll find that. <clears throat> As Maguire and I have shown in our previous study, applying computational analysis to text corpora can help to identify emotional communities in which common patterns and sentiment lexica are found. My paper today will address, begin to address these questions by <clears throat> first identifying the emotional vocabularies of personal narratives all in these two corpora, exploring a methodology for measuring those um, sentiments, and also offer an alternate method for analysis and interpretation. And at the very end, I ask whether or not such a comparative perspective could be applied to the personal papers held here in Halle. And I make this latter claim, and I hope you will forgive me for sort of cheating a bit and drawing on Methodist narratives, um, based on Hindmarsh's argument that Zinzendorf's dispute with the Halepietists on the necessity of a Bußkampf as proof of conversion in 1740 it happens at exactly the same time as his <coughs> contact with the Wes Wesleys and Methodism. In Heinbarsch's eyes, um, the, the fact this meant that the Moravians and their followers 
were able to distinguish their own piety from that of the Methodists in very much the same way as Sinzendorf was claiming that the Helmholtz could distinguish their piety from Hellenza pietism. Turning first to the question of emotional communities within pietism, the role of language in creating, maintaining, and promoting specific religious sentiments has long been recognized and studied. As August Langen states in the preface to the first edition of his groundbreaking work, Der Wortschatz des Deutschen Pietismus, published in 1954, the impetus for his focus was the realization that, quote, ein wesentlicher Teil dieser Aufgabe in der Untersuchung der sprachlichen Mittel bestehen müsse. So, um, sorry about the word order there. Um, erst mit der eingehenden Prüfung des psychologischen Wortschatzes erfassen wir die Grundlagen der dichterischen Menschendarstellung und der Erfahrungsseelenlehre des 18. Jahrhunderts. Despite the exciting lexical and pragmatic potential of, Langen, of Langen's work, little has been done in the field of linguistics on the peculiar nature of religious language and its function and use within religious communities. This dearth of further research has led Alexander Lasch and Wolf Andreas Liebert in the 2017 volume on the pragmatics of religious language to claim that although the pragmatic turn in cultural studies has been seen in many social and humanistic disciplines, it has not been as prevalent in studies of language use in religious practice, and certainly not in the study of pietism. <clears throat> what I would like to develop in this paper is an extension of Lush's arguments about the pragmatic function of language as it expresses the ineffable in his essay on the transcendent, and for me, working on something which I claim is as equally ineffable and indescribable, that is, emotions. However, given that the linguistic expression of emotions, as we have seen in others' work, such as that by Gisela Metteler, Ulrike Gleixner, Phyllis Mack, Bruce Heinmarsch, uh, Juliana Elgenbrecht, and certainly most recently in the, public, in the uh, volume published by Uta Frewart, um, there is this idea that emotions can be trained. I'm going to supplement the analysis with the methodology of a psychologist, James Pennebaker, and his research into the role of the unconscious in the formulation of our linguistic worlds. I have already published a short excursus into this methodology in the examination of emotional communities with Michael Maguire. However, here I would like to first look at the sentiment lexica extracted from the two corpora, compare them, and then look at function word analysis in the two corpora. <clears throat> but first, a little excursus into um, emotional practices. And I recognize that Monique Shears focuses on the 19th century, but a lot of the literature that she draws on is applicable also looking to earlier periods. And there may be some conclusions in here that the theologians amongst us are going to go, no, no. So I'm just prepared, all right? <clears throat> so what are emotions? In her recent volume on enthusiasm, Monique Shear draws on uh, Bourdieu's practice theory to think through the embodied nature of emotions, to counter the prevalent thought that we are the passive recipients of an emotional response, which in some ways is um, the rooting of aesthetics, right, in the emotional response of the body. Shear defines emotions as a form of embodied action and in do a doing that exists only within cultural habitus and context. She argues that emotions, although sometimes felt as passive experiences, are in fact actions that our bodies actively engage in. These emotional actions are influenced by factors like language, societal structure, cultural norms, and are part of broader cultural practices that are closely linked with our activities and interactions with spaces, objects, sounds, and people. This spectrum of emotional activity can range from fleeting reactions to long established behavior patterns and can involve various tools, cultural artifacts, and linguistic forms. Such emotional actions in context are termed emotional practices. Using Bourdieu's practice theory to understand emotions is valuable as it perceives actions not as just deliberate intentions but also as habitual behaviors. <clears throat> it distinguishes from the traditional idea of action where behavior is intentional and based on an understanding of purpose. 
In practice theory, individuals are seen as products of their practices, not as pre-existing entities. And that's where I'm waiting for the sharp intake of breath from the theologians. It posits that there is no innate inner life. Our understanding and expression of emotions and self are culturally cultivated. This cultivation varies across time and societies, cultures, social classes. For example, the Western understanding of self and emotions has been shaped by specific societal, cultural, and political events that focus on the individual, but that is not a universal. Thus, an emotional response triggered by a sermon or a hymn can be considered not in terms of, uh, in terms of a, um, a, a duality of uh, authenticity versus, say, manipulation, but rather speaks to the community's methods of shaping emotion <coughs> and self-awareness within a given cultural context. The history of emotions has shifted from focus on in institutionally institutional influences to examining individuals' navigation through moral, religious, and political constraints on emotional expression. Early studies emphasized how institutions controlled how members expressed emotions, delineating acceptable and unacceptable feelings as a form of social control. William Reddy, one of the uh, big names in the, in the history of emotions and person to have written uh, one of the major texts, introduced the concept of emotional regimes, which are normative orders established by political regimes. These regimes can handle deviant emotions by allowing <clears throat> for what he terms emotional refuges, private or secret areas, where people can express emotions that are outside the norm. And I think within the context of both Moravian and Methodist um, studies, we can immediately think of where those spaces exist. Reddy suggests that emotional regimes must permit deviation to be effective. In terms of defining emotional communities, Barbara Rosenwein, her work is very helpful and moving us <clears throat> away from an institutional approach, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and towards thinking. <clears throat> it's drying here. Okay. Towards thinking through emotions in a group of people who share similar socioeconomic and political interests or religious affiliations and th therefore similar systems of feeling. These communities can be diverse and non exclusive and also um, homogenous and exclusive. But also we can have communities with individuals who belong to multiple communities at once, such as perhaps within the Moravian system, a choir house, but also there is a biological family, there is a gender aspect, and there is also a national aspect as well. And for me, this comes to the fore very much within the missions. <clears throat> Emotional communities can compete or conflict with each other. So, for example, in mission diaries, you may find that there is an emotional community that is attached to, for example, um, Onondaga identity, national identity. And then how does that work together with a Moravian emotional community, a concept of an, a Moravian emotional community? So these different emotional communities can and have to work together, but they don't always work together. Historians engage with psychologists and sociologists, anthropologists, to understand this dynamic. Belonging to multiple emotional communities can lead to political issues. It can challenge emotional regimes and can contribute to a constantly changing normative landscape that dictates which emotional practices are acceptable and which are not through a practice of um, evidential norming. The norming of emotions refers to the process by which societies, cultures, or groups establish norms and standards for emotional expression. This process involves defining which emotions are acceptable or appropriate and how they can be expressed in different contexts. Within the Methodist context, is there a norming for, for example, the um, fight with the devil and the um, emotions that are associated with this 
fight with evil. And that is a very different emotional community to the Moravian one, which doesn't mention this at all. But I'll get on to the linguistic stuff in a sec. Um, <clears throat> emotional norms can vary, as I said before, widely across different cultures and social settings and play a significant role in how individuals experience and express their emotions. In the context of code switching, which is the practice of alternating between two or more languages, dialects, or variety of languages in conversation, the norming of emotion plays a crucial role. When people switch between languages, they are often switching between cultural contexts and emotional norms that are associated with those contexts. And again, within the diaries, for example, I've just been very, um, working very hard on the uh, mission diaries. What's interesting to look at is when the mission diarist uses German, when the mission diarist uses a quotation in, for example, Onondaga, or Cayuga, or Delaware, Lenape, um, in order to express the speaker's emotion. Why does the diarist choose to quote that um, indigenous person in the indigenous language rather than translating it? And sometimes not translating it, uh, or sometimes choosing to translate it. And David Seisberger is a great uh, example of this, um, as we know from your work. So the methodology that I have used in this analysis of uh, the Methodist application letters and the Moravian memoirs is best described as a mixed method, emotion analysis that goes beyond traditional sentiment analysis. Whereas the latter focuses primarily on categorizing text into positive, negative, and neutral sentiments, the method that I prefer is um, detects and I classify specific emotions expressed in granular text data going down to the lemma level or phrase level of a sentence. Um, this method provides a much more nuanced understanding of the emotional states described by individuals <clears throat> in their texts. So here are some of the key aspects of emotional analysis. I don't know if that's big enough for you to be able to read. Um, I will do my best to get through this quickly. So in terms of emotional classification, this means classifying text into a range of emotional categories, such as joy, anger, sadness, fear, surprise, disgust, etc. And some, uh, if you have read or you remember the presentation that Mike and I gave at the International Pietism Conference on emotions, we have Kluchek's wheel, that nice little rainbow wheel, that gives you not only the different kinds of emotions, but also spatializes the, their differential and their um, oppositions, and also their intensities as well. Um, and this sort of leads into the um, second piece, where you can look at the close relationship between emotions. Um, there are emotional lexica and data sets, which are very, very useful. Um, so that you can actually encode what the, if you like, the value of a particular emotion is. <clears throat> and then contextual um, understanding, where emotional analysis considers the historical, religious, philosophical, theological context in which emotions are expressed. And um, artificial intelligence is actually very helpful in being able to develop this kind of very fine-grained contextual understanding and I have used artificial intelligence or generative AI in some of the analyses that you're going to see um, in a minute. Um, also, uh, emotional intensity. Again, if you remember Pluchek's wheel, the colors on the outside are not as intense as the colors on the inside of the wheel. So using a kind of chloropleth map to be able to measure the intensity of emotion. Um, all right. Let me see what's on the next one. Okay, move on. I am getting to my corpus now. All right. As mentioned at the outset, comparative studies and communities of emotion are very few. One extremely relevant one to my paper is what I briefly mentioned at the beginning, that by Bruce Hindmarsh, where in chapter five of his work on evangelical conversion narratives, he draws on the, me on the memoirs of two 18th century British sisters, so Moravian British sisters, Susanna and Betsy Claggett, to deepen his examination of what he calls the fault lines or differences 
between the experiences of conversion in Methodist and Moravian written culture. The Claggetts provide an excellent point of comparison, as, like quite a few other men and women in 1740s London, they were basically shopping around for a church, or a chapel, or a religious community, or a preacher that best suited their spiritual and emotional needs. According to Hindmarsh, Charles Wesley was in frequent contact, personal contact, with the Claggett family between 1739 and 1740, when Susanna Claggett would have been between 15 and 16. And he came up with a series of texts to convert her to Methodism, a sortes biblicae, that led her through a conversion experience. However, shortly after this experience and acquaintance with Wesley, Susanna met the Moravians in England, Molta, Bula, and even Zinzendorf himself. Heinmarsh quotes Susanna's memoir, which is on the Moravian Lives website, to describe her experience of awakening. And she writes the following in her memoir. This was a new awakening of an evangelical kind, differing entirely from the former, i.e. the Methodist one, which was legal. Now I was in a quite particular leading of the Holy Spirit. I felt my depravity, but not with fright and terror. Floods of tears streamed from my eyes, and in a tender godly sorrow and contrition, my heart was day and night sighing soft for the beloved. End of quote. To be able to find such first-person accounts that compare the experience of spiritual awakening with the Methodists and the Moravians is, of course, reine Glückssache, right? I mean, it's very, very unusual. And it is even more rare to find a writing subject that uses the exact official wording that differentiates the two movements' understanding of an internal awakening, i.e. legal, right? Um, and then fright and terror from the quotation, and then at the other, in the Moravian awakening, her, her heart was sighing soft for her beloved. <clears throat> um, given that Susanna's Moravian memoir was complete, completed later in her life, it is very possible that she had internalized a vocabulary of differentiation that the Moravians employed to separate themselves from the Methodists. However, this is also, may also be an accurate description of her emotional experience within these two emotional communities. Heinmarsh's arguments have dominated comparative studies. His emphasis on the dichotomy between Methodist enthusiasm and Moravian stillness. His claim that two narrative cultures of conversion had formed in the early in in revivals in England is very prevalent. But can we show this? Can we test his claim? Are Moravians yielding to the savior and the Methodists actively fighting with the devil? The Methodist texts that form this comparative corpus come from the collection housed at the Rylands Library. The testimonies form part of the archive of the Methodist Church in Britain, deposited at the University of Manchester. Written in response to the request from the revival leadership for accounts of conversion for use in sermons and publications, they span the first 50 years of Methodism's existence, with many dating to the formative experience of 1739 to 1745. In 2015, the University of Manchester Library digitized the manuscript testimonies and placed the collection online together with the transcripts of the testimonies. The Methodist Church in Britain used a system of crowdsourcing to complete the work of transcription, uh, and this was completed by September 2018. From this collection, I have selected letters of petition that are in the first person, contemporaneous with the Moravian uh, congregation in Fetter Lane, and describe emotional states of conversion. In this corpus, there are seven male authors and 13 women. The marital state of the authors is yet to be determined. The texts by male authors vary in length from 801 to 5, 000, just over 5,000 words, and the texts by female authors from 300 to just over 2,000 words. The corpus of Mar Fetale Moravian memoirs is also selected for first-person authorship and the time period contemporaneous with the Methodists. It's much, um, they're less memoirs but more text, 
So in the three memoirs by men, they range in, range in length from two and a half thousand to just under 10,000 words. In the six women's memoirs, they range in length from 2,200 words to around 11,000. I want to say in advance, there are of course significant generic differences between letters of application and memoirs. However, both sets of documents reveal shared and distinctive emotional vocabularies uh, for both groups. And I will return to this generic difference later on. Um, here is looking at the Lemma Devil in the Methodist men's uh, memoirs using Antconk um, as the, uh, the tool here to, to create this visualization. Um, in the Methodist corpus, we find the language of the devil and temptation, perhaps indicating um, the struggle or Buskampf that Heinmarsch mentions. There is no mention of the devil in the Moravian corpus. However, there are instances where an author sees an angel or Christ in a dream state or awake. And here we are um, in the Methodist women's memoirs. Um, one of the things that I was struck when I was reading through these, and I'm sorry, I'm not going to do a close, close reading of the text, but reading through these texts um, was the vividness with which the, de the devil is depicted in the Methodist text, both by the men and the women. And there you see, um, another time I thought I saw the devil standing upon the bed with great <coughs> claws over me. Um, it's sort of very Shelley-ish. So turning now to another methodology, looking at most frequent words. Um, this is where you can create um, using nouns, which are the words, um, nouns and verbs and adjectives, which words appear most in the text. Most frequent words in the Methodist men's corpus are God, Lord, time, went, thought. In the Methodist women's, they are Lord, the, God, thought, self. In the Moravian corpus, the in the men's text, saviour, time, heart, great. And in the women's text, are heart, time, lord, dear, love. And just from this brief comparison of um, the vocabulary, we might say that there is already dis obvious, a clear distinction between the two corpora in the prevalence of thought in the Methodist text and heart in the Moravian text. Another interesting finding is that both male Methodists and male and female Moravians mention time, which is absent in the Methodist women's texts. Extracting the emotional vocabularies from both corpora, we find the Methodist texts cite um, these emotions, whereas the Moravians cite these. And there is um, a preponderance of um, positive emotion in the Moravian text versus negative emotion in the Methodist text. So here we have a graphing of the um, corpus here, the Methodist men, and the occurrences of each of those terms in the top there, of which are the negative emotions. And here in the Methodist women's text, here in the Moravian women's text, the terms are different, and here within the men's text, which is very interesting, this one. So, okay, I'm going to hurry up. Um, I think I might have five minutes left. Yes? Yes? Thank you. All right. Um, given the issues mentioned above about code switching, which entails this hyperconscious use of language, can we then turn to the use of the analysis of function words to produce more accurate comparison? Um, James Pennebaker has developed a methodology that relies not on the content words like the verbs and the nouns that are uh, adjectives that I just described to you to, to uh, analyze what we say, but rather on stop words, which are usually in linguistic analysis, what you remove. Function words are articles, prepositions, pronouns, negations, auxiliary verbs, and in other words, parts of speech that we use unconsciously, and they are used at a very high rate. They are short and hard to detect and they are processed in a different part of the brain than content words. So my, what I'm not trying to ask is, can using this method circumvent the idea of 
people having absorbed linguistic um, norming within their emotional community and much more um, think, uh, look at the unconscious use of emotions. Uh, all right, so I'm going to move forward. So um, running the, both the Methodist and Moravian text through um, what's called the Linguistic Inquiry and Word Choice Program, and then using a Python script to analyze correlations, these are the findings that I came up with. In the Methodist women's text, the correlations between negative emotions and the usage, usage of I pronouns um, is moderately positive, suggesting that there is a tendency for increased uses of I pronouns to be associated with an increase in the expression of negative emotions. The dimension that correlates most strongly with sad emotional state is that of conversation. This strong correlation indicates that texts with more conversational content tend to have higher expressions of sadness. Is this a product of both the gender of the author and the genre of letter? As we know, the epistolary form in the 18th century allowed women to write in a more conversational and confessional style and therefore perhaps also invited expressions of sadness. For the Methodist men, the dimensions that correlate most strongly with a sad emotional state are shown linguistically through the use of verbs rather than adjectives um, and verbs that are strongly associated with expressions of sadness. Most interestingly, there is a strong correlation between uh, spatial language and expressions of sadness. This correlation suggests that in the text by Methodist men, sadness is closely linked with the use of verbs and with spatial references. The two corpora by Methodist men and women do show similarities. Both show strong correlations between um, sad and, pos and positive emotional dimensions and other linguistic features. All right, I'm going to jump ahead. I don't want to forget the women. Okay. In the text by Fetalay Moravian women, the dimensions that correlate most strongly with positive emotions are affect, certainty, tone, and interestingly, achievement. These correlations suggest that in this data set, expressions of positive emotion are closely linked with references to achievement and motivational language. For the Moravian men, from Fatalane, the dimension that correlates most strongly with positive emotions is work. This strong correlation between positive emotion and work, I would argue, reflects the religious and spiritual significance of labor or vocational duties in the Moravian community. All right, last slide. Okay, so here's just a summary of what I found on the left-hand side and then a couple of questions here on the right-hand side. Um, when thinking about comparativity, whether in terms of religion, emotions, music, or text, one has to decide what the terms of comparison will be. What is your tertium comparitonis? In translation theory, we can divide between signifiers and signified, assuming that the signified is somehow a constant. But is that true with emotions? Given the subjective embodied experience of emotion, what could that constant be? This paper has tried to explore how applying computational analysis of both conscious and unconscious use of language to express emotion can perhaps help to identify distinctive and parallel vocabularies and lexica. Thinking about Shear's application of practice theory outlined above, where emotional responses are communally ratified through a system of norming, perhaps turning to the unconscious use of function words can reveal similarities and differences between emotional communities. How might this methodology be applied to pietist texts, Haller pietist texts? As I mentioned at the beginning, I have not yet begun this work, um, but it is my intention to get there. Um, as I move forward with this project, it will be interesting to see how the choice of language affects emotional expression, because I will be working in German. Scholars in bilingualism have done some fascinating work on the choice of language and emotion. Do we feel different emotions when we speak different languages? I would say yes. Again, in my work as a translator of Moravian texts by authors from multiple cultural, ethnic, and linguistic backgrounds, I have been fascinated to see when a diarist or memoir writer not only code switches, but switches language to ask, and then I would ask the question, why? Thank you.